Sarah here with Cooking with the First Ladies. Uh, today I will be sharing uh, some recipes for Florence Harding and a few to celebrate the upcoming 100 year anniversary of women's suffrage. Uh, so happy birthday Florence Harding, born on this day on August 15th, 1860. Florence Harding was known as the Duchess and her husband referred to her as the boss. Uh, these are both uh, pretty appropriate nicknames for a first lady uh, who literally took issues such as women's suffrage uh, and equality into her own hands. Uh, today, I want to share some fascinating tidbits about this very progressive and popular first lady, as well as talk a little bit about women's suffrage, which again will celebrate its 100th anniversary this month on August 18th. Uh, now, Florence uh, studied classical piano. She eventually attended the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and became a piano teacher for local children in her hometown of Marion, Ohio. Uh, she ultimately charged about 25 cents an hour, and all of this was after her first husband, which is usually thought to have been a common law marriage, left her and their child. Uh, she was eventually granted a divorce, which was kind of the only paper trail about their union, uh, but this was after he not only left them, uh, but then went on to rob a train. Uh, she met Warren Harding, uh, who at the time was the owner of the local newspaper, the Marion Star. Uh, they married when Florence was 30, and very shortly after, Warren Harding had kind of a mental breakdown. Uh, he was admitted into Battle Creek Sanitarium, and at that point, Florence basically ran the newspaper. Uh, she not only acted as a business manager, uh, but also reviewed articles, making some editorial decisions, and hired the very first female reporter in the state, Jane Dixon. Uh, this experience allowed her to be more comfortable with the press when she entered the public eye. Uh, she sort of helped to craft their image um, in the news. Um, and in the press. Um, this possibly made her the first first lady to kind of know how to manipulate the press. And although she was very self-conscious about how she looked in newsreels and photographs, uh, she developed what would become the photo op. Uh, she can even be seen in some newsreels directing the cameraman on how to uh, set up the shots and what exactly she wanted them to focus on because she didn't want very stiffly posed photographs. She wanted to show more action and um, excitement. Uh, Florence was also a radical supporter for the humane treatment of animals and the ASPCA. Uh, she actually removed all of the big game heads from the stateroom that had been placed by Theodore Roosevelt. Now, although she did wear furs, uh, she only wore furs from animals that had died of natural causes. Um, also, on occasion, she would allow their Airedale dog, Laddie Boy, to be a guest at animal rights events in order to raise money. Um, now, the Hardings held front porch campaigns from their home in Ohio, which was uh, actually successfully done by three previous Ohio-born presidents, Harrison, Garfield, and McKinley. Uh, this allowed Florence to show herself as both a traditional housewife uh, and a modern activist. Uh, she would often switch her roles from wearing an apron and cooking or pairing, wife, or pairing apples with farmer's wives to then refusing to wear a wedding ring because she saw it as a symbol of bondage. Uh, she would also tell some reporters that she disliked cooking, but then she would go on to share her famous waffle recipe, which I will share with you um, today. So I did pre-make my mix, um, and her waffle recipe includes sugar which interestingly enough, she led a national boycott against the product when it became too expensive for regular households to afford. Um, this sort of showed how she did stand in solidarity with women as well as the American people. Uh, the waffles were known for being not too sweet and very fluffy. Uh, they call for two eggs, two tablespoons of sugar, a teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons melted butter, a pint of milk, uh, which is directly from her recipe, but that's two cups of milk, and two cups of flour to thin the batter, and two large teaspoons of baking powder. So first you're going to separate your eggs, uh, beat the yolks, and add the sugar and salt. 
then add butter, milk, and the flour. Uh, then stir to combine or use a mix, mixer, which is what I did. Um, next, beat the egg whites until they are stiff and little peaks form. Uh, make sure it doesn't get too dry. Then stir in one spoonful of the whites to kind of lighten it and then fold in the remainder of the egg whites and the baking powder. Uh, finally, bake in your waffle iron. Usually takes about four to five minutes to cook on this one. Um, if you'd like to just try your hand at making waffles, you can get one of these for about $10. Um, so while we wait on this one to cook, um, I do have a couple that I made earlier, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Florence Harding. Uh, but before the Girl Scouts actually raised money with cookies, they sold waffles. Um, the Washington DC Scouts operated a tea room, which was a popular fad in the early 1920s, and the establishment was frequented by both the Hardings and the Coolidges. Uh, the toppings that they served were more traditional, uh, while Warren Harding preferred to top his with chipped beef gravy. Um, he also went on to say that he loved waffles so much it was okay to eat a few with butter, um, just not too much. Uh, Florence's waffle recipe uh, was widely published in 1920, and it featured many ingredients that had been rationed during the war. And it was also part of a national campaign known as Back to Normalcy. Uh, Harding promised a return to simpler, less chaotic times, and the campaign also focused on moving forward and having a kind of order and steadiness of things, but not turning back the clock. Um, he also wanted restoration rather than radical change, as voters had come out of the years leading up to the 1920 election uh, with the ending of World War I, a global influenza pandemic, race riots, and labor strikes in cities across America, which some of that sounds slightly familiar right now, just 100 years later. Uh, his victory was a landslide. It was the largest margin of success for any presidential candidate until, uh, that, point, uh, until that point in history. Uh, he was also the only president to be elected on his birthday. Um, supposedly, he and Florence stayed up on uh, election night reading congratulatory letters. Uh, Florence Harding was the first incoming first lady to ride to the Capitol with her predecessor, and upon the arrival at the White House said, well, Warren Harding, I got you the presidency. Now what are you going to do? Uh, the campaign had also promised a neighborly administration, and right off the bat, she made the decision to keep the windows and gates open to the White House. Uh, in addition, uh, she immediately opened the White House to the public um, and to visitors, often conducting some of the tours herself, claiming it, it was the people's house and they should have access to not only the White House, but also the president. Um, this did upset some members of Congress who felt that they didn't have um, that personal um, ability to visit the White House. Everyone kind of had it at that point. Um, in fact, uh, Florence, when she greeted the public, she physically touched them, hugged them, sometimes even kissed them on the cheek, which was previously unheard of for a first lady. Um, these actions prompted her to be very popular. A song, Flow from Ohio, was written uh, for her and in her honor, and flossy clings were a style adapted by young women copying her silk neck bands that she wore. Uh, she reflected a lot of popular culture at the time as well by owning a radio, playing mahjong, bringing jazz to the White House, and her fashion choices uh, reflected the rage for Egyptian motifs as King Tut's tomb uh, had just been discovered in early 1920s. Uh, she was also the very first lady to host Hollywood actors at the White House and even occasionally screened feature movies following state dinners. Uh, and lastly, she was also the first to fly in an airplane. Uh, so uh, the waffle is still cooking just a little bit. Um, so we'll let that cook just a little bit longer. Uh, but of course, with your waffles, you can top it with Harding's uh, chipped beef and gravy or a traditional butter and syrup or whipped cream and berries. Um, now, if you ever visit the Harding's home in Marion, Ohio, there is actually still a waffle maker um, displayed in their kitchen. Many people that have visited the home say it looks like they just picked up and had just walked out. Uh, Florence not only uh, publicly worked uh, with wounded veterans of World War I, but also privately advocated for veterans' welfare and made several visits to the hospital to see the men, uh, who she called my boys. Uh, she began a campaign called the Lest We Forget Week to collect donations of items such as books and, and foods uh, needed in the hospital wards. 
Uh, she would even take the time to visit veterans across the country when they traveled. Um, this was kind of very close to her as she was kind of very sickly as a child and always um, had some kidney problems. Uh, she would sometimes go as far as to have her car stop and pick up veterans to take to their destination if she saw them on crutches. Uh, Florence also led a national effort to create the World War I monument at the National Mall. Now another recipe, which mine turned out to be a little bit of a fail, so I can't show it to you today, uh, but it came from a cookbook called Mrs. Harding's 20th Century Cookbook and her recipes for candy making. Unfortunately, the book is out of print, but one recipe I found online was for rose red candy, which is basically boiled sugar and water until it crystallizes. And then her suggestions were to dye it with either rose or raspberry. Again, I did attempt the recipe. Mine turned out way too sticky, way too thin on the wax paper and got all um, stuck, but it was a very pretty color using fresh raspberry dye. Um, anyway, unlike any previous presidential candidates' wives, um, she publicly stated her political opinions, especially her pro-women suffrage views. In fact, she became the first first lady to vote for her husband as president in the 1920 elections. Um, she not only wanted the voting rights for women, but also equal rights um, for them in the workplace and more, using her own experiences oftentimes from working at her father's store as a young girl um, as examples. Um, she invited not only women's political groups or um, activist groups to the White House, but girls uh, were also invited that were graduating from high school and college um, and women federal workers. Uh, Florence envisioned, as she said, a community of women working together under the guidance of other women. So I think this waffle is about done. Um, now, Florence uh, Harding also invited Marie uh, Curie to illustrate her view of professional women um, as equal to men, as of course, uh, she and her husband uh, partnered together in their award-winning scientific research. Um, she hoped this would be a good example of how ideal family relationships would work in the future. Uh, when Marie visited in 1921, the Hardings presented her with a gram of radium for all of her work. Um, now, of course, as we know today, radium is extremely radioactive. Uh, Florence also supported a prison reform movement in response to the harsh treatment of the women suffragists um, that they experienced in prison. And with working with other women's groups, this resulted in the first correctional facility just for women. Uh, Florence said, let women know and appreciate the meaning of being an American, free and equal. Um, of course, again, August 18th will mark the 100 year anniversary of women's suffrage and for women gaining the right to vote. Uh, the path to ratifying the 19th Amendment took well over 100 years. In 1776, um, Abigail Adams wrote a letter to her husband saying, remember the ladies as they were drafting uh, the Declaration of Independence, showing that uh, equality and the ability to be a part of politics had long been on women's minds. Now, flash forward to 1919, when the 19th Amendment was passed by Congress under President Wilson, which stated the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Um, so now all they needed was 36 states to ratify. And here in Tennessee, we became the very last, uh, known as the perfect 36. Um, so for weeks before that vote, both sides of the movement set up here in Nashville at the Hermitage Hotel in downtown near the state capitol. One observer said that the Battle of Nashville during the Civil War was like a five o'clock tea party uh, compared to the suffrage fight that summer. Ultimately, Harry Byrne, only 22 at the time, cast the tie-breaking vote in favor, even though he wore the red rose of the anti-suffrage movement. Uh, he was acting on a letter from his mother urging him to be a good boy and help Miss Cat put the rat in ratification. Uh, in addition, the letter uh, in addition to the letter, Jewish suffragist Anita Pulitzer is credited with changing Harry's mind after being one of the last to meet with him the night before the vote. Um, now, one tactic suffragettes, uh, suffragists used was a cookbook. 
Um, these cookbooks were meant to show that if women gained the right to vote, uh, they could still cook and continue to do more traditional roles, but also have a part in the decision making for the country. The cookbooks came with propaganda for the cause and the recipes ranged from parfaits and pickles to soups and bread. Uh, one very popular recipe was uh, the Lady Baltimore cake. Um, now I made the cake ahead of time. Uh, it is a two, um, you can also make it a three layer cake. Um, I chose to just make two. Um, so you'll need a cake pan, a nine inch cake pan. Um, and if you have multiple cake pans, it'll make it go a little bit faster. Um, also, once you cook your cakes, Make sure they're sliced so they're very flat, there's no domes, and let them cool very thoroughly. Uh, probably just put it in the refrigerator. Uh, your cake butter or cake batter, excuse me, will have two sticks of melted butter, a th one and three fourths cup sugar, two teaspoons vanilla, three cups flour, one tablespoon baking powder, a teaspoon of salt, one cup of buttermilk, and six large egg whites. Uh, butter your pans very well. You can even use parchment rounds in the bottom. Butter that, add a little flour. Um, just make sure it's very greased up so your cake doesn't stick. Uh, now for the cake batter, mix the butter, sugar, and vanilla in a mixer until fluffy. In a separate bowl, mix together the flour, baking powder, and salt. Then slowly add the mixture into the mixer. Um, also add about half of the buttermilk. Um, then slowly add the rest of the buttermilk um, alternating with the flour mixture very slowly. Um, move your batter to the cake pans or a separate bowl, depending on how many cake pans you have, um, and wash the mixer bowl in order to make the filling. Um, you're gonna be baking your cakes um, on 350 uh, for about 25, 30 minutes. Um, now to make the filling, uh, you combine rum uh, if you want, or it can be substituted with rum flavoring or none at all, and just a touch of almond extract instead, or I use just a little bit of port. Um, it also calls for raisins, um, and then you can choose between dried apricots or figs. Um, I actually just went ahead and used both, and then you simmer all that together on the stove. Um, continue until it's sticky, and if using the rum or the liquor has been absorbed. Um, remove it from the heat, mix in pecans. Uh, cool to room temperature. Uh, next, while the cakes are baking, you're going to want to make the frosting, so you'll need your cleaned mixer again. Uh, beat the egg whites and cream of tartar to medium stiff peaks. Um, using a medium high speed on your mixer. And then in a saucepan, you'll combine uh, sugar, water, corn syrup, and salt, and boil, but uh, just make sure you're dissolving the sugar. Um, you also don't wanna stir it, just occasionally swirl the pot. Boil this very carefully until a little firm, and then slowly mix the syrup into your egg whites in the mixer. Then add vanilla, uh, increase to medium high, and beat until it's thick and spreadable and slightly um, opaque, and the mixer is cool to the touch. Um, this whole process for the icing, which ends up, mine kind of turned out to be a little bit like marshmallow fluff, pretty sticky. Um, it does take a little longer than you would think to get the consistency that you want. Um, to assemble your cake, again, you want to make sure they're very flat um, or as flat as you can make them. Uh, put down your first layer, um, spread it with your filling. Um, you can also spread it with a layer of icing. Place your next layer and repeat um, until you have all of your layers. Um, next, you can decorate it however you want. Um, I did the suffragette, suffragist colors of purple and yellow uh, with the white frosting backdrop. Um, also, occasionally the cookbooks had interesting submissions, uh, such as this for an emergency salad, which called for one-tenth onion and uh, one-tenth apple with any salad dressing, which is what makes it must be emergency. Um, it's very simple uh, for a salad dressing that's also contained in this book um, that you can make um, is using four eggs, two teaspoons mustard, a little red pepper, one cup apple cider vinegar, and butter. Um, and the amount of butter you need is about the size of an egg, it says. Um, so basically mix all those ingredients and cook on the stove, but not hot enough to curdle the eggs. Slowly mix in the vinegar, add butter as you take it off the heat. The recipe says it should stay good for about six weeks in cold weather and about three months if it's warm weather and you're using an ice box. Um, so I made a similar dressing um, using white wine vinegar, Dijon mustard, and honey with a pinch of pepper. And then you can just shake it up really good, make sure your honey gets mixed in, and drizzle it over uh, right before you serve. Um, this actually had a really good flavor um, and was a very crisp salad. Uh, the cookbooks also had fun recipes. 
um, for uh, things such as a pie for a suffragist doubting husband, which one ingredient in that was human kindness. Another was the anti's favorite hash, uh, the anti's, of course, being the anti-suffrage movement, um, which ingredients included a generous handful of injustice, a pound of truth thoroughly mangled, a little vitriol for Tang, and a sting of nonsense uh, to be stirred with a sharp knife. Um, now, lastly, uh, Florence Harding was a strong believer in the Zodiac and even had a personal astrologer known as Madame Marcia, uh, who was very popular with the upper class um, in the early 1920s. Um, now, in early 1920, Marcia predicted that Harding would win the nomination and the election, but would not live to see a full four-year term. Florence continued communicating with Marcia in letters even after entering the White House using the code name Jupiter. Now, 1923 saw the prediction come true when Warren Harding passed away during a cross-country trip where they were actually the first president and first lady to visit Alaska, which some have attributed his death to bad shellfish because he did complain of a lot of stomach pain and cramps in the days uh, leading up to his death. But ultimately, uh, it was most likely a heart attack, um, but there was no autopsy performed um, per Florence's request. On the first night, his coffin laid in state in the East Room of the White House. Florence was draped in a black veil. She had the flag removed and the coffin opened so that she could speak with her husband. Now, contrary to the rumors, Florence Harding did not kill her husband by poisoning, uh, which was uh, basically mostly due to a book uh, published in the 1930s by a former member of the Harding administration. Now, luckily, Florence had passed away by the time some of these books were published. Um, because they did slightly tarnish her reputation. So thank goodness she didn't have to actually see that. Um, so thanks y'all so much for watching and I hope you'll try some of these recipes and maybe make a Lady Baltimore cake to celebrate women's suffrage on August 18th. Um, now if you're interested in learning more about uh, women's suffrage, uh, The Woman's Hour is a great book. Um, this focuses on that summer in 1920 um, here in Nashville for the most part and some of the key players. Um, so once again, thanks y'all and I will see you next time.